I'm slightly at odds with what to call this recording. I, I guess I'll call it something like furthermore on gender politics, but I'm going to also talk a lot about histrionic and borderline uh, manifestations and cultural analogies and such. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be a kind of at least an indirect response to Sam Vaknin. Um, like a, a lot of the features that he goes through are... I, I don't know how to... Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to make an illegitimate argument against his general perspective. And I know that it's not a complete counter to what he is saying, because there are many features that fall under what he is extolling, which are important features that have to be uh, understood. And, and But I do think that the kind of polemic that he is um, generating is uh, essentially the wrong one. But the ingredients in that need do need to be um, absorbed into something, into some structured... Uh, 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 take and perspective, which I'm going to try to provide as well. But, um, you know, some of his conclusions are approximately correct, but I think that it's a slight misdiagnosis um, on the proximate cause of those things and how if things, if, 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 if certain facts in recent modern history uh, were just altered or attenuated slightly, we would have a much more sane version of gender politics than the one that we currently sit with. Um, okay, yeah, so I, again, I'm just going to echo the, the thing that I pointed out, that I, d I don't think, I think it's wrong to essentially say that women have been chattel and slaves for for 10,000 years, and this is a kind of natural evolutionary um, segue into into eventually maybe reaching some kind of armistice or something like that. Well, that's that's not even his uh, thesis. Uh, that's not Sam Vaknin's thesis. But I think that you know that it's natural that there's a kind of reactionary sort of thing coming from, you know, I, I, I don't think that there's this inexorable idea that the victim becomes the perpetrator. I, 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 I don't, um, uh, I, I think it's also historically inaccurate. I mean, like, what do girls and women of today share culturally with people a hundred years ago? You know, I, I, I don't, I think that's even quite tenuous. Um, I am sensitive that there are going to be social constructs which we inherit that are that from that historical residue that are being that have to be digested and processed in some way. Um, but I think that how they have been processed is going to be more. Um, uh, based on on the features that I'm going to use as an alternative ex explanatory um, uh, system. So uh, I'm going to generally say that um, although traditionally the hard power was on the side of men, um, I'm, I'm still going to say that the soft power was by and large held by women culturally. And you can say, oh, there's no competition between hard and soft power. I, I think um, in some sense that's true in some contexts, but in most contexts, in the general experience, um, uh, women exerted I would also say a kind of a, a greater form of exploitation. Um, 
which they could even disguise and bulwark as being a, a mark of um, imposition put against them. So they could fulfill an exploitative role relative to society or the men in their lives, and they could also claim to be the victim of it. So they were doubly blessed by optics, by the optics, and, their, and, and, and therefore they could more simplistically leverage cultural power and, and social pressure um, to aid them in a kind of simplistic politics of appearances, and they could not be blamed for being in that kind of a cultural economy um, of optics because uh, it was all that was relegated to them, or something like that. Um, Uh, now, I'm not going to say that these sorts of power, powers were equal, the hard power and the soft power, um, but, but there was a balance of power, uh, there was a balance of different powers, and in that confusion and, and those asymmetries that abound, there was a negotiating table in the midst um, of that fundamental confusion that could not very clearly lie on one side or the other side, at least in most general circumstances. Obviously, there are probably extremes on both ends in which um, the hard power was suffocating and the soft power was suffocating. But anyway, um, I would say for a vast majority of people, there was a place of, of a kind of interpersonal um, compromise, of an interpersonal, um, individually forged contract in this environmental um, field, uh, you know, which could also be a form of of um, negotiated intimacy or something like that. Um, so, yes, there's going to be background noise, but there is always going to be a sort of a table of negotiation and compromise, which people can through the noise, find their way to that table. I mean, even, I would say, uh, there was, in The Handmaid's Tale, that series, you see that there's a, um, there's one of the high-status men in the system who has a house full of women that he has collected, essentially, to save them from the system, to somewhat shield them and their independence and their non-conformity with the system because he essentially ideologically uh, doesn't believe in that, you know, so, so uh, that I would say is the kind of SX interrelatability, the SX instinctual um, variant um, of respecting the individual, as it were, um, and having to forge a, a particular... relationship uh, and line on integrity between the interpersonal dimension or within the interpersonal dimension. Anyway, um, now I'm going to say that generally the thing that we suffer from in the modern context is that both hard and soft power, which are both social factors, which are both components of the, um, the social instinctual variant, uh, symptomatic of those things, both belong to women, essentially. 
they've got the legal system on their side in divorces, helping them essentially uh, uh, get away with the kind of wealth wealth transfers, which are not measured, but you know, well, you could just say the the general line of no fault divorce in terms of how that has been developed um, into such a pro female centric. Um, you know, like the, the promotion of, of women's interests just because they're women somehow, um, without any kind of objective criteria um, that kind of rationalizes this uh, uh, or puts in some kind of counterbalance. You know, I mean, this I would say is, is part of the reason why so many men have essentially just opted out of um, the social systems in, in which that have been dominated by women um like divorce law or family law um now if you essentially okay let me just reduce this in, into a basic sort of argument is that women don't are de-incentivized to come down to the negotiating table they don't have to get serious. They don't have to get real because they they hold all the cards already and they would have to already sacrifice their winning hand in order to, to meet the other party at the negotiating or bargaining table. So there's no, there's only a, descent, a disincentive to compromise. And even as they suffer for this lack of unwillingness to compromise or, or, or to, or to rationalize, uh, they end up having to create a crystallized ideology that somewhat, um, grants integrity for that non, you know, for that non-compromise role. And that is essentially the kind of ideology that you get in radical feminism and systemic oppression, patriarchy stuff which is essentially a kind of propaganda, as far as I can see, to bring up factors that have nothing to do with, with the modern circumstance, except by analogy and correlation and making, basically, I would say, un, uh, you know, it, it's almost like a, a metaphorical um, uh, uh, moral projection of, of trying to, to steal a polemic that has long since been irrelevant and to project it onto the present to, to give these people a sense of, of self-righteousness or something like that, or, or a sense of, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not arguing this very neatly, but anyway, um, let me just plod through. And uh, this ideology, especially from the hard power in the legal system, or not even the ideology, but the mentality that is being bred, essentially, is that the subjective feeling of the woman is just as important as a material fact. That her feelings, her subjective uh, uh, feeling states is just as important as any pragmatic concern. In fact, it's, it's almost more important. And so she can, as long as she, she can generate what sounds like a story, like it's believed by the system, it's, it's taken, it's reified by the system as being a kind of objective criterion. Now, when you give someone that kind of power, to me, it's indistinguishable from a kind of ideological function or, or a kind of cultural machine of, of, of borderline, or even perhaps histrionic, but uh, I would say it's perhaps closer to borderline, where there's also, I, I, I've, I've got a better formulation of, I think, describing the pathological influence and that borderline um, does to other people, which is essentially that the reason why borderline has this dysregula dysregulated identity um, is because it has this um, 
internal inconsistency and juxtaposition of, of switching back and forth between SX, uh, uh, the sexual um, instinctual variant, and the social instinctual variant. And that they actually have... Um, they treat those two things as a kind of hybridized, interchangeable, um, common currency. And they give themselves the right to separate these two paradigms and have them both simultaneously and to voice the one and then voice the other. And so they kind of, ha it's, it's as if they are playing two, two different chess games at the same time, but they have the same pieces. And if they take the one piece on the one chess board, they get to delete the same piece on the, on the, on the alternative chess board. So it's like they can play two games and other people can only play one game. Um, and so when they are addressing you, you are only allowed to move the piece on the corresponding chessboard that they're addressing you at. But when they take your pieces, they, they take both pieces. That's the kind of um, calculus that is, is perpetrating, uh, that is being uh, uh, perpetrated. And so they have this um, inconsistency between taxing the sexual instinctual variant and and affecting the social instinctual variant or more so it's the other way around that they are imploring the rules and dictates of the social instinctual variant and they're making you absorb them according to, to the sick the sexual interpersonal um, thing now in borderline this is especially aggravating because at least when a histrionic does this the histrionic has the patience of setting up the context of even telegraphing very openly the step the trap to which that you are falling into the the the, the circumstances within which um they they are going to be um caustically um demanding things of you because you know essentially um you know the histrionic can i think get a bit dysregulated if you actually directly confront the implicit syllogism that they're trying to um deploy on you and you actually semantically disentangle it or you show it to be essentially um, a mismatch for what it is that they're trying to do and which is generally when they would just sort of implore arguments from authority that, you know, they just know far more, uh, don't question the, their, their, their authoritative voice or source of knowledge, um, or credential or, or convention or something like that, that they're tapped into some higher, you know, sacred cow that you socially can't afford to cross or to challenge. Um, that's the kind of history, whereas the, the borderline will just essentially teleport into the winning configuration and will, will just kind of lie about the facts. They will selectively tailor the history. They, they will conglomerate a story based on you know, a, a descriptive mass that, that they have a history of essentially just gainsaying. And, and randomly importing. Um, and you can, obviously, this manifests in a few different ways. How it manifests in the House of Mirrors, where they have less of the dysregulated identity. Uh, because it's kind of bound together by the malevolence. And this is when you see both of these factors occurring at the same time. When they are objectifying their host and shattering the mirror that their host is and dispersing those reflective shards in, a, in amongst their narrative, in amongst their, their environmental um, condition, which, which they are um, blaming on, on the other person. And, it's, and those shards are filling in the gaps in, 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 the, in the laxity of their story. Um, in order to shield them from, from having to contend 
let's say, their own intimacy or their own internal line of integrity, um, which is just completely uh, cradled by the description of their condition, which, which is uh, inhabited fully by, by the other person's fractured um, participation, uh, uh, which is dispersed in such a wise so as to as to complete the the story um, that they are essentially the the reaction that, that they are merely reacting to passively so they're taking on that kind of that intellectual passive role of dictating the a kind of a resolution which they would generally be trying to get somebody else to independently manacle on themselves to 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 to, to um, you know, they are essentially being the voice of the grid cloud, as, as I say, say it, but, um, so, I mean, the, when they do this, it's very strange, because when they are the voice of this grid cloud, they are, instead, they even have, perhaps even, a stronger grasp on aspects of reality that have happened, then they have quite a delusional projection of projected intentionality on the other person so that they will um, be useful as, as, as a fragmented commodity dispersed amongst that set of facts in order to, to create enough mirror shards that... Um, never have to have them question their own sense of responsibility or accountability. It's, it's completely, um, uh, obfuscated and diverted and redirected to the reflection of, of the, of the host. So the host becomes part of the reality medium, which they are, uh, set themselves up as, as being conditioned by and merely passively reacting to and trying to manage but then they're also voicing it actively they're being the voice of this narrative so again like the, just being the voice of this itself is already a kind of amalgamate also between the sx and the so but obviously the the, the intimate interrelatedness here is completely stultified. They have objectified the other person into a form of atrophied death, into a complete um, object that then has been, as a, as a fractured mirror, um, embedded into the reality tunnel, almost. Or I, I don't want to mix semantics too much, but I mean, I, I just call it the house of mirrors. Um, and in some sense, the House of Mirrors is uncomfortable for them because it isn't the optimal way of interfacing with their host. They would much rather, so, so they, they want to be begged to move into a different room, to move beyond the House of Mirrors or to essentially put that trick, that card back under wraps. But it's a kind of, it's, it's a phase of a defense mechanism. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's, uh, I mean, I think if, if, if they ever are to get better, they are to get better from that point, from, from that perspective, but it's probably too much effort anyway. Um, you know, they would probably actually just even dispose of that person and find a new host. Uh, in which they can just start it all again and not have to go through the House of Mirrors or something like that. You know, the kind of the tolerance that they would have to have to continue to inhabit the House of Mirrors because that, that will eventually start generating cognitive dissonance because essentially it's difficult to act when you are, when you are rationalizing all of your, your acting as a passive intellectual reaction to somebody else's conditioning. But 
in as so far as you can even keep that perspective alive, you're going to at least start start to create some kind of consistency in your experiences. You're going to start collating a memory bank of consistencies, or, or of a consistent line of 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 experience, and then when that starts to to create dissonances because it's very hard to act in reaction to somebody else um, completely and totally uh, especially if if they are distancing themselves so then they have a um, they, they're going to start running into problems where when they create their own problems how can they outsource that how can they outsource that accountability that blame you know they need more mirror shards you know they have to take the mirror shards that they already have and break them yet again and fragment them into an even more finer ubiquitous commodity to distribute throughout their environment to embed in their supposed conditioning and they have to keep on doing this every time they run into a kind of some kind of cognitive dissonance of well you know did i just do that how how can i outsource that and um yeah so i mean the level to which that they freeze the fractured mirror components of the house of mirrors will will have to be compensated for by either intense emotional dysregulation but if they if they keep both in tandem then at least they will perhaps start to see their internal mechanism they will start to see this internal procedure that they are doing but you know they're um i mean i i don't think that they need necessarily the experience of what they are doing internally because I, I believe that they are doing it actively they're they are motivated to do the dishonest behavior um, they are motivated to to uh, deploy this this operation um, anyway uh, I mean so the way of of, of um, of, I think fundamentally describing the pathology of, of the borderline is that they will not stick to a single instinctual variant in the relation between their inner child and their feeling body or said another way in the relation between their unconscious side of the mind and their subconscious side of the mind they will not I mean you know you, you could argue that you know it is possible to relate to your feeling body with more than one instinctual variant I mean, even the 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 general structure of instinctual variants say that people have a, a dominant one and they have a secondary one and perhaps even a tertiary one uh, that it's not possible to have no relation to any of the instinctual variants but anyway um their pathology essentially is is that they see t at least two instinctual variants as being fundamentally interchangeable with one another that they can stop doing the one and just use the other one to do both or to, to cover the territory of both and vice versa and they can unilaterally switch between these things and it is that unilateral switching which will create the dysregulated confused mixtures that you'll have a kind of um and, and this is exactly what you see ideal, ideologically in sort of feminism, that the subjective feeling and, and perception of the victim class or whatever becomes the objective systemic conditioning of, of reality. You know? So these things become the one is, is, a, is, a, is the call sign of the other. Um, And I do think that essentially this has been facilitated by the, um, the corruption of, of systems that have made it essentially too easy and convenient 
to, to have this style of judgment or discerning facilitated and, and essentially afforded integrity by the system, by the hard power. So the hard power in the world has already conformed itself to this ideological self-aggravating, self self-fueling sort of complaint machine that validates the, the, the complaint. Um, and because the complaint is fundamentally fallacious, it just uh, bubbles over, you know, it just um, inflates. Um, or it just sort of monotonously uh, continues on in, in some kind of, in, in going through a kind of seasonal cycling. Um, of going through different phases of the same of the same ideological condition, but in slightly different, you know, um, yeah. And, and, I mean, I, I would just call it hyperrealism, you know, in the kind of which was used to describe the kind of uh, fascistic culture. Um, Yeah, and I was going to also say some more things about gender politics that I think, I mean, I, I think this is why men in general, especially young uh, boys in high school, or whatever, um, I, I think this is what is generally exacerbating things like school shootings and things like that, because I think that, you know, these young troubled men and things like that, when, when you're young, uh, in general, you you are learning about your culture, your society. Um, you, you, you are monitoring things on a thematic level. And I think that people realize the extent to which the general cultural overlay is so lopsided, is so biased, is so fundamentally... Um, uh, ideologically stacked against them, as it were. And I think that all of those um, features essentially create a kind of, um, well, they either get imprinted on it, you know, they, they sort of, they try to, to sort of in their own mind, okay, well, I need to fight fire with fire, but I'm not on the popular front. I, I can't, you know, like the, there's no group think that automatically affords integrity to my mentality you know i'm i'm the victim of the cultural hegemon at the moment and then you get this kind of desperate kind of um psychological breakdown uh and this kind of doom spiral cascade which is ironic because it feeds exactly the ideological propaganda that they're probably reacting to but i mean it is as young jung said uh, what you resist persists um, okay um anyway uh So I, I think that we would be living with a very different kind of gender politics if there was any clear space for the bargaining table, for, for the negotiating table, for compromise. And because there isn't, because also almost on an evolutionary le level, um, in terms of how women have related to the sexual marketplace, which are still... I think overriding structures which uh, can still be used to to, to plot um, generally how women function as a as a as a generalization as as, as a group that they compete on the level of of a of a kind of status with other women. And they're not going to settle for what they imagine 
many other women have access to. Um, they're not going to settle for less for what they expect many other women have access to. And, and I think in general, standards have inflated because of this kind of ideological, imaginary sort of idea that they can have it all on a kind of, it's not, it, on a deluded, lopsided game that they are playing, which is the only game they can play, because there is no such thing as, as a pragmatic compromise bargaining table. It just, it doesn't exist. Because it would be too painful to lower yourself down to that level, especially in the kind of inter-female competition in, in terms of social status. And so because this ideology holds the cultural hegemon, it is Im impressed upon women that it is the, the kind of the basic set of standards. And so we have a basic set of standards that are fundamentally, let's say, histrionic. Um, and they're a lopsided unilateral control of reality. Um, and being able, you know, so it's, I, I do think that... Um, The, the general ideological adherent of this is a, is a kind of hybridized histrionic, but the, the, the ideology itself can be deployed in many different fields. So it, it archetypally is somewhat borderline, but generally when people are trying to engage in it in good faith, they're trying to use some of the borderline magic of being able to repurpose the, the abstract structure of how it functions into any particular domain and any particular sort of field that they can always just kind of table thumb basic demands that oh no no like I don't care what it's called I don't care the terminology is I just want representation I describe the quantitative quotas that just must be filled in order to meet this ideological goal of representation So, so they've got the set of semantic tricks essentially that allows them to completely disconnect from the interpersonal level of dealing with something. They can just completely subvert it and go into a completely alternative paradigm of social conventions, social rules social um, stricture, uh, they can use a dogmatic orthodoxy essentially to supplement for, um, and then they can still kind of profess to have both running simultaneously or within their ideological priorities or something like that. I'm just trying to lay that as a kind of archetype for how women can relate to any man in particular, how they can essentially be of two minds and essentially how they can want to have their cake and eat it. And this is the, the general cultural standard. Now, if that is the general cultural standard, there's no compromise table, there's no negotiation, and there's just a kind of inflation of expectation and demands. Now, we still have basic ideas of equality which are abstractly still in the mix and these are fundamentally actually now become toxic <laughs> ironically because they're mixed with this ideology which is fundamentally um, uh, sexist and racialist uh, because of some kind of historical propaganda you know it's the kind of the SJW version of equality mixed with the old um, version of equality and when you have both of these things together they do actually end up creating an extra toxicity because now if women can do something they become the archetype 
of how everyone in society should have the same freedom. Except for maybe the scapegoat, in which is the linchpin of, of all of this, in which they have to make room for everyone else to have the same freedom. But he, on, on, an, on a very abstract level, everyone should have the same level. You know, that's the kind of the ideal, the cultural ideal of the cultural hegemon. That's the, 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 the pinnacle aspiration. Now, if everyone is abstractly trying to imagine scenarios and contexts and cultures in which this can be facilitated, this is fundamentally problematic. That means everyone's standards go up and inflate to insane proportions. And, uh, and that's, this is what I think is all the things that Sam Vaknin is talking about in terms of obsession with availability, the immediacy of are you making to me available all the things that I want on my list and not being able to compromise or rationalize for missing any of that and then wanting to, to manifest that as a cloud of expectation which can be shared by a group of other people or something like that which i think is is just as um you know on some abstract conceptual plane it can it can maybe work but i don't think it's it's commensurate with human um uh it's it, it's it's just not workable it's it's not uh, in fact the compromise itself is should is part of a, of an SX is part of an intimate interpersonal development, which essentially is just being circumvented by this kind of cloud murkiness, which has been vectored in from the feminine sort of ideological sort of thing, but which isn't in, in some sense it it, it is. A pathological manifestation of of the general feminine interface with culture which has been to leverage social constructs because women didn't have hard power they didn't get to choose the religious dogma that ruled over them Let, let's just say that even though I think to a large degree it was always developed with them in mind in order to create a sustainable balance of some level but they didn't get to choose the rules, but what they could do is they could choose the interpretation of the rules to a large degree, that they could mold the interpretation, and they could mold this by leveraging conformity. This is why I think women prize, you know, I mean, they're, they're things that men would never get away with, that women get away with all the time in the idea, you know, that... that, that Women need to stick together in order to to prosecute their their interests. This has always been internally a tumultuous thing to arrange for women because it has a lot of intra female subjugation to some kind of conformist culture that then, as a block, they can um, women can in totality aggregate more power and cultural control and levers um, you know if, if they do want to actually have the same level of let's say dignity and integrity that men have in, in terms of their social cultural masks um, they just need to adopt the male interface uh, which they are loath to do because they want both they want both powers they want the freedom to be an individual but they want to be treated as a power block um, that has the, the special rights and the special interests and the special um, lobbying power that a block has and no one else is allowed to to, to conglomerate into similar power structures because uh, it's woman's turn now or something like that um, or some kind of superficial, you know, uh, or some kind of re re retributivistic, you know, kind of uh, narrative. But um, okay, I'm yeah. This is a, I'm not describing these things in such a neat way, but that is one way of characterizing the um, 
the fundamental inconsistency. That also whenever men did conglomerate into a system, this, you know, the, the main sort of objective of any system that, that men have operated essentially was in order to deliver satisfaction to women, was in order to, to some, you know, was to create an expedient system in which men were empowered to deliver to women what they expected and what they demanded. And they definitely had these demands and these expectations, and they judged men according to those demands and expectations. And essentially forced men in order to, to, to um, collaborate with each other in, in order to band together to upscale efficiency and whatever, in order to be able to give to women their, their uh, access to, to higher social status and to outbid other men in providing that access to women. I think I've also said this before, and the thing that made women empowered in this set of different powers was they got to choose who that man would be. So they could essentially uh, you know, there's a lot of there are lots of layers of cultural soft power because they could judge men based on their ability to, to perhaps be reasoned with, to communicate and, and to come to shared agreements. And, you know, that, that offered the way to, to the, the bargaining table, to the realistic compromise, to, 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 to the trust, the interpersonal trust. Now, essentially, interpersonal trust is completely subverted by kind of ideological trust. And it is like stamped in the ideology that the ideological trust is a, is a higher ideal and the, and the interpersonal trust must make itself subservient to the ideological trust, to the social strictures, um, because that's part of a kind of cosmic justice that subverts the, the negotiated trust and negotiated agreement in in a shared sort of justice or something like that and the idea that almost you can instrumentalize the interpersonal connection for the higher justice of the social structure um, that must take uh, uh, that must prevail and take precedence over it and and, and dominate it um, As I said before, this was somewhat ameliorated because both parties could agree that social structures maybe should take precedence, but those social structures were divided amongst male and female lines between hard power and soft power, and they were both integral to some degree. They, you know, all the soft power compounded makes um, is just as is coercive as, as hard power uh, and in fact the soft power contextualizes hard power so it's uh, you can argue that it's even more powerful um, and in fact all the hard power in fact does is confer obligation is confer duties um, and if that hard power is not uh, administered or deployed within the structure of hard power, it has an internal um, self-regulating uh, apparatus, because otherwise it wouldn't be hard. So it might be hard in that it punish, it, it can punish for non-compliance, but it also um, you know, it wouldn't be a very efficient system if it didn't have some kind of even-handed measure of or, or or objective bounds of criteria, you know. So the, 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 there's objective criteria that attaches to the hard power, which 
is nothing, there's no similar constraint to the soft power other than essentially a politics of optics, of, of social politics, of how things, a, 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 a politics of appearances, which, which women have always been um, great at interfacing with, especially with the aid of, of controlling social politics as a block and, and creating, through conformity, creating social constructs and social structures um, which have to be abided by, which have to uh, be appeased. Um, Now, this was a fairly good uh, dispersal of specialized roles because in that c concatenate of, of difference and, and, and potential of confusion, there was at least also a potential of a negotiating table, of an interrelated trust that could be developed, uh, of individual self-regulation hard power and soft power be damned, that although society confers these capacities, they could be thus limited contractually between the interpersonal connection. Uh, the kind of ideology that we live under, as, uh, with, with the cultural hegemon that we have at the moment, that's just completely um, passé. <clears throat> the the borderline the canonical archetypal sort of borderline ideal is just uh, too captivating somehow it's captivated the imagination of too many women uh, they it has enough social credentials sorry it has enough cultural credential it, it has enough tokens of academic prestige and intellectual substantiation i mean it doesn't really have a coherent intellectual substantiation you know um it's all up in the air they're sort of you know just kind of but you know they believe that it's going to come together at some point and it's worth pursuing in the interim. So, and enough to kind of keep the bandwagon moving forward. Um, with their leveraging of this weird combination of soft and hard power at anyone who tries to derail the bandwagon or debunk it, um, which essentially just, you know, they end up getting destroyed even on a personal level. Uh, targeted on a personal level. Um, because of the, the hyper-realism and the, and the hysteria. Um, anyway, uh, let me get back to what I was talking about. So why am I talking about these things? Um, so yeah, Sam Buckman goes through all the conditions and the, and the material historical sort of things and I think a lot of the things that he says about modern relations are all true but I, I think I guess I'm making a counterfactual point that you know it did, didn't have to be this way and if we changed very little I think something completely different would have come into view something very different would have happened but because essentially we closed the avenue of the 90s version of equality by this kind of intellectual toxicity and of of and social to, social poison that we inculcated into the legal system, into marriage law and such, um, that that has basically um, made this kind of cultural collective ideation inevitable, um, and I don't. I don't agree that it is inevitable because of some kind of grand historic polemic over thousands of years. Uh, I think that this has even happened in other societies and other cultures. Um, I think it, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
it is a form of cultural pathology. Um, I, th I think it, it happened in, in Nazi society in, in Weimar, Germany. I think it's, it's very analogous to that. I think especially if we look at the, the feminine political energy that infused Nazi culture um, and propelled it and launched it. which had, at least in, in the proto-fascist phase, it was indistinguishable from what we're experiencing at the moment. For example, the, the anarchistic and communistic feminine verve, which was basically echoed by the Nazi feminine cultural base, although theirs was, was more particularized as, as a a demand for an insured and guaranteed route to uh, social status um, that arguably is not really delivered on in its promise, except that essentially, in as much as that the society at large succeeds, um, Aryan women would be privileged over women of that don't have that attribute of being Aryan. Um, I don't know, I need to get back to what I was talking about, but yeah, I had this element of what I wanted to talk about that had to do with license as well. Um, let me go to my notes. Uh, okay, these notes are a bit all over the place, but um, on gender politics, Sam Vaknin. Yeah, so I, I wanted to almost make an ad hominem argument against Sam Vaknin, but I don't want to be too harsh. Um, but And this argument actually just is trying to reinforce my, my other points um, more so than, than being a standalone argument. But I'm uh, almost going to make the point that he is seemed to me to be entrenched in the game of appearances and of social politics which is a style of reduction to social pressures and environmental leveraging of politics of a narrative and, and appearances um because i i i was somewhat making a parallel that perhaps his narcissistic style of thinking about things of leveraging social politics makes it slightly makes him more prone to making polemics which are more tenuous uh, than, the, than they might appear to be uh, described as. Um, and, the, and then my counter-argument is there still had to be an actual SX bond, uh, an intimate bond. Um, intimacy is not supplemented interchangeably for social technical descriptions of power, Soft power is, is also far more important. So that me is me trying to break his polemic about how women have been chattel for so long. Um, description of borderline as being in uh, oh yeah uh, description of borderline as being an SX and SO pathology of interchangeability, an unset bond with that inner child and the feeling body. Unset is using SX and SO styles of abruptly substituting for one another interchangeably without telegraphed coherence as the feeling body um, or through the without a telegraphed coherence through the through essentially a solitary feeling body, um, which then is the feeling body is not a distinct entity um, in order to allow for both strategies to be deployed in confusio and interchangeably. Uh, next paragraph, gender politics, common manifestations in culture. This is, okay, yeah, so I wanted to say, uh, this is almost a kind of general point as well, that gender politics is always going to be polluted to a large degree if one is going to reduce one's interpretation to common manifestations in culture, because this will always be a badly representative this will always be badly representative of some lowest common denominator 
to energy slavery and a culture of borderline normalization uh, and be prone to a culture of borderline normalization. If some ingredients were missing, uh, the, per the permissiveness of the legal system to develop into a no-fault divorce and onerous financial honoring of a woman's mere preference to dissolve a union with spoils and wealth transfer and alimony, uh, which we are seeing a, a natural cultural reaction to in the form of Mitgau and the anti-marriage consensus. If this piece of the puzzle was missing, there would be a, a more even brokerage of power to facilitate an honest negotiation of, you, of the utility or contents of agreement in the underlying contract um, as the basis of an enduring relationship. Women would have an easier time to collectively get real, come to their senses, and get into the business of serious, authentic, realistic negotiation of a shared reality. The nature of borderline governed, uh, the nature of a borderline governed culture, um, which is sanctified by the enlisting of crucial aspects of legal functioning and the mechanics of, of rules, gives women the latitude to propound the borderline hegemony of permissive one-sided values that promote self-deluded claims of system victimization. Whenever the interpersonal transaction of a biased exploit uh, whenever the interpersonal transaction of a biased exploitation is not successful for the woman's interest. Oh yeah, so I'm saying that. Uh, I'm saying that the one-sided values that promote the self-deluded claims of system victimization happen whenever the interpersonal transaction of a biased exploitation is not successful uh, or favorable uh, to the woman's interest. Um, so, I mean, just a, a way of, of summarizing my argument in, in, a very, in a very crude way is that it's a feminist mafia society that doesn't have to infect every corner of the culture, just key technical T tactical components that permit it to operate and grow as a valid modus operandi option of behavior to be resorted to even at any time in the future so you know what's what's hideous is that you can let's say find a woman that you have an interpersonal bond with have honesty with have a kind of uh, bespoke contractual trust as the underlying basis of the relationship and then they can still resort to the feminist modus operandi because it is technically supported by the legal system. Uh, this asymmetry in technical power, according to the legal system, is an important point that needs reform to even allow for the negotiation and cultural value of women uh, to be responsible for their choice of partner. Okay, yeah, this is something that I didn't develop that I wanted to develop that essentially part of the huge brokerage in terms of the common negotiating table was that for every power that women were deprived of relative to the higher status of men uh, or the higher, um, in traditional terms, that they had higher status, um, women had a choice about what man they were going to uh, choose. And so whatever asymmetry there was in society, it could somewhat be ameliorated by women essentially forcing the man to comply with certain even bespoke regulation that would come from the feminine component. That would come from, have you read these books? How do you, you know, like essentially you could work out a person's personal gender politics um, they could create their own test system. They could create their own, and, and, and this can also be reinforced by cultural norms. They could also, certain standards could be set, could be pegged um, as women operating as a block, or at least as a, as a starting point of certain basic expectations and, and entitlement. Um, which was generally how women... Uh, uh, ameliorated the hard power with the soft power. Um, uh, this asymmetry in technical power, according to the legal system, is an important point that needs reform. Uh, uh. 
it is an important point that needs reform to even allow for the negotiation and cult culture and cultural value of women of being responsible for their choice of partner so in some sense okay i, I didn't i didn't make this argument properly um women were responsible for who they married essentially and now functionally they are not they don't need to be responsible the only thing that they have to be responsible about is if they that they might be called stupid if they didn't marry someone that if they divorced they would get a lot of money from the divorce that that that's essentially the only thing that they are responsible for in terms of this new ideological paradigm um it is not worth marrying someone unless, you know, uh, by divorcing them, uh, you come out clearly uh, vic um, stronger or, or in a stronger position, uh, having transferred some wealth. This asymmetry in technical... Oh, okay, uh, let me not read that again. Um, so, But anyway, like, so before the balance of power was that women, because they were given, let's say, no economic independent status, they were fully in control of their choice of partner. And therefore, it was fully up to them to choose someone who was going to be compatible with their modus operandi, with, with their interpersonal idea of what trust would entail. Um, and essentially now in the, in the modern in the modern position, women are no longer responsible for their choice of partner. There is no consequence. In fact, the only consequence is a, is that if they might marry someone that they wouldn't profit from divorcing. That's the only possible thing. So it's in some sense, it completely changes the nature of, of relationship entirely, uh, and at least of committed marriage. Um, I'm still not explaining this well, but anyway, that, that, that has all the ingredients in it. Removing this piece of the puzzle is what undoes the gender diode. Women are un unaccountable for their choice, but are rewarded through any complaints they might generate. This is the distance between the genders. Men are held responsible for any choice a woman may make. And thus there is no common sense of integrity, only male integrity versus female entitlement which is an unfair matchup. So women no longer have to represent integrity in their choice of partner. It, their choice of partner does not have to be a representative token of, of how they are revealing their integrity. It is, it, 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 it's a, I understand that it's perhaps, it wasn't the best uh, arrangement structurally that, that it was obviously asymmetrical to a large extent because then women could get stranded if the man changes during the course of the relationship. But again, you could also say, well, then women had to be make themselves responsible for learning how to work out if a man was had a changeable character or his level of fortitude or something like that or, or his level of consistency. It forced women to have to develop that kind of choice and that that they actually had to be willing to to abide by that choice that it was infused with some kind of cultural integrity or or, or that that is donated from their individual capacity now they don't have any such internal commitment they don't have to make any such you know essentially as a, as a social piece the female entity has no integrity and just has entitlement and then they can leverage that entitlement against male integrity which still has to be uh, that still has to offer some integral responsiveness to that female ent entitlement so when i say the male i'm basically saying that that there was a kind of integrity diode between men and women but now that diode has been supplanted by a new diode which is not a diode, which is male integrity and female entitlement. So effectively, women are now no longer adults in the same way that men are. They use subjective feeling and fact interchangeably. This is the, his 
histrionic culture that is poisoning gender politics and thus status quo uh, and, and and this status quo has been legally entrenched and sanctioned by law by the laws governing divorce for instance uh, and other things as well but um so the dynamic of relationships themselves have been poisoned by this excess and disproportionate level of female license they take on dysregulated mirages of psychopathic men, but this is a product of maintaining the ideological framing and implicit justification of the structure of their new relation to the sexual marketplace. They have been uprooted and left ungrounded by their own distance from the, from the negotiating table, decadent and spoiled by a framing ideology of misanthropy and systematic projections, which amount to their own calcified embodied and ironically, uh, which amount to their own calcified embodied, ironically, in what they ideologically rail against. So I'm basically saying that what they project on the system is ironically what they embody in a calcified form, um, which is ironically exactly what their ideology ostensibly rails against. So they are what they hate. Sorry, my grammar is, is a bit awful. But, um, this is all perpetuated because of, the, of how the cultural narrative that women's subjective feelings with some measure of actual rules amount to re a reality, and those rules being the ideological rules, uh, which they deserve to game, they deserve to game reality. Thus, they are isolated as unilateral chess-playing demons, leveraging dysregulated emotions as the justification for the ongoing subversive drama of projection and ideological self-considered victimization. Uh, the major linchpin of the lopsided license for, uh, for dishonesty, I'm saying the lopsided license is the license for dishonesty, is the inability to access consistent, intimate relating. Without the interference of social pressures being leveraged by the narrative opportunist, uh, 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 by, by narrative opportunities afforded through societal con con condemnation, uh, the social hegemony of rules. Um, consistent, intimate relating is and has always been possible and Uh, the social relating, uh, the law be damned, was generally always in the feminine tool house to be leveraged against men. So I'm basically saying the soft cultural power was always the predominant force within the social relating field. Um, in some sense, the division between hard and soft power was enough to create an opportunity for both to come to the, S, uh, to, to, the, to the intimate negotiating table. Now there is no incentive for women to do so. In fact, the opposite. Uh, they are disincentivized to do so as it would be to, uh, to relegate both hard and soft power that they now possess and contend in a socially sanctioned way. And men are left with the rags of trying to make utilitarian arguments for family life and fawning the accessibility of intimate partnership, which will be generally insignificant in its su success owing to the great asymmetry of hard power or legal bias and the cultural tendency towards normalizing the lowest common denominator when it also holds an ideological hegemony. So I'm basically saying it's it's a cultural engine that is now sort of out of control, that is obviously spinning out of control. But um, yeah, so the importance of pristine... Uh, okay, this is a different paragraph, perhaps a different point. Uh, the importance of a pristine intimate bonding... Um, an intimate relating to each other that is not adulterated by social pressure propaganda and misleading surrealist inceptions would generate enough common ground to permit the art of compromise but not in this culture which has been railroaded by feminine ideologic uh, ideological um, hegemony of a psychopathic borderline variety which uses a house of mirrors to divert from its own ringmaster participation in its own self-fulfilling narrative and reality games. Okay, how much of entertaining these high standards are because of the feminine tendency to compare and contrast their own successes through the hypothetical license of other women and leveraging that standard to subvert the intimate bond 
but also in this age of subjective feminine feeling criteria, uh, supplementing for factual reality in terms of its importance to cultural arbitration, uh, does imply a proximate solution of flipping the gender roles and males being the gatekeepers for relationships and intimate connection, which memory has been erased, uh, which the memory of which has been erased from the societal game that is feminine orientated and controlled. Uh, which the narrative cannot, which which has a narrative that cannot be contradicted or depicted in art or media, uh, media without severe castigation. So I'm basically saying that even depictions of the intimate bond are fundamentally. Um, I can't think of a, a a nice phrase. There's probably a nice French phrase for this. But it's off limits now. You, you are not allowed to show the visceral, intimate bond um, that isn't just mere sex. You, 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 you cannot actually show a, a kind of a visceral connectivity of an interpersonal trust that, that subverts social pressures and social stricture. Um, and I'm basically saying that even under these conditions, it's still possible to have such a bond. But I'm just saying that it's never going to be, it's, it's not really going to take hold in a culture that is fundamentally, that has fundamentally outlawed it. It's to, that, that, that has fundamentally, um, that is fundamentally suppressing it because it is the only thing that that cures its um its complaint or, or at least subverts its complaint um the inherent mediator of any sanity or balanced gender relations was the intimate bond look at handmaid's tale series the one guy who saves women in his house while socially concealing his liberal tendency reassessing this facility is the only hope, although we can say this facility was perhaps never the overwhelming majority of couples, we can take a sophisticated view of its composition and its failure to be accessed, lower common denominator influences and such, forging the agreement sub substracted against the politics and pressures of environmental social structures. So I'm saying that although the, S the intimate bond was never, let's say, was never a pervasive feature within culture and society. It was the lifeblood of authenticity. It was the lifeblood of sanity. And yes, our, our cultures and our populations have never been characterized in the majority of being sane. They've never been non-pathological in, in their majority. But it's the level to which that we actually get a cultural hegemon that calcifies and and promulgates as the status quo a pathological thing that fundamentally subverts the the same let's say gender politics we, we have we have serious trouble um, and also we could also have gone the other way if we had stayed on the on the 90s equality kind of level of equality and when people were having relationship troubles if we didn't fuck over our society in technical ways, we could have promoted the tools of promoting authentic, intimate bonding. We could have used that as the solve instead of the, the toxic ideology reinforced by the lopsided exploitation and or female privilege. Um, so instead, we decided to create an idolatry around female privilege instead of uh, and, and, and entrenching it. And normalizing it instead of actually um, trying to deal with it intelligently. Uh, anyway, um, the standards get uh, also because of let's say the intellectual capture and and toxicity, um, and essentially, which is why we now essentially have no more non-sexism. Non-sexism as a philosophy is fundamentally suppressed um, in in modern culture. Uh, Instead, we have this anti-sexism parade of borderline insanity. Uh, the standards get inflate. Okay, oh, okay. Uh, the standards get inflated to an insanely high baseline, especially seen through the filter of 
hypergamy and biological asymmetry and sexual marketplace discrepancies between the sexes. I went over that earlier, um, the detail of that, that, that is almost just like a uh, heading. And I just wanted to say that in general, social and intimate interchangeability is, I think, almost a, a solid way of describing what, when people say histrionic and borderline reality tunnels, or I think reality tunnels are perhaps more related to borderline sort of manifestation. But when people say reality tunnels in, in personality disordered context, I think, I think that that actually can be seen as the social instinctual variant and the sexual instinctual variant being treated interchangeably. And yeah, I could have probably gone through some of that a bit more eloquently, but th those are my notes. And I think that that at least is all the content that I wanted to, to, to get through. Um, Uh, this is an addendum. I'm just going to go back and elaborate some things that I think are, are worth emphasis. So I think that the, the kind of the open confabulation um, the cultural permissiveness of, of being able to essentially unilaterally push the reset button on intimate one-on-one -on -one relations not just in when i say sx i mean when i say in intimacy i mean um in the context of of the the sexual instinctual variant um as a as a as a survival strategy so it doesn't mean even gender it just means one-on-one -on -one interaction it means having a kind of a one-on-one -on -one trust being able to cultivate um uh a bond that is based on inner insight and inner certainty and and collaboration or coordination between a kind of personal trust that isn't essentially enforced by um you know it, it might be somewhat framed and regarded or disregarded by different cultural contexts by different social pressures but it's somewhat independent of that it's like an inner trust that you might have and be able to cultivate with people an inner understanding or a, a, an indiv a one on one individual understanding um so that's why it's called the sexual variant because i i'm it's meant to connotate intimacy um so the being able to unilaterally push the reset button on developing that kind of or facilitating that kind of in, um, intimacy by being able to almost unilaterally opt out of it in order to to sort of play a second game a secondary game that has this intervening interrupting quality about it the game of, of social pressure that's ideologically governed or sanctioned or whatever with a kind of cosmic justice which means that essentially one is not within the the ostensible ideological stricture one is not being schizophrenic even though one is it's facilitating a schizophrenic transition of of almost flipping back and forth between oh no no i'm just trying to make sure that we are following the dogma that we're following the rules of representation within social justice politics or whatever they have these kinds of this moral code that is positivistically described um, and that can be used to surreptitiously disguise pushing the reset button on the interpersonal trust um, and so just as borderlines play this two-faced game where they go backwards and forwards in order to it, it's, it's quite interesting because i mean this is i like calling it self-triangulation even though i know that that word triangulation is used to mean romantic triangulation in in a in a kind of in a uh when i say triangulation i mean for example when someone 
uh, is in the uncomfortable when a board line is in the uncomfortable position of being in that in in, in in leveraging the house of mirrors tactic, which is fundamentally problematic because they are giving for voice to their own bad faith outwardly, and they are kind of disrupting the roles which they need other people to take because they're kind of doing it for them. They want to retreat from that. They want to retreat from that naked malevolence that they are expressing. Uh, and they want to retreat from that exteriorized control that they are managing because then they're going to compound cognitive dissonance and, and such. So they want to retreat from that position. And so, you know, they can do it in a multitude of ways. They, they can do it in some sense by trying to give someone... A kind of um, tr trying to test out decompartmentalizing that phase of the House of Mirrors to go back to an earlier phase, to kind of re-import the old setup again, and to kind of try to usher towards going in towards that more stable, covert operating. And essentially they do this by almost blatant dishonesty, by, by sort of blatantly reframing everything and trying to create a new setup and if the other person doesn't buy it, doesn't buy into that narrative, doesn't let them sort of just segue back into the old sort of style of, of okay, well, you deal with, the, you know, the host uh, of the borderline needs to actually deal with the, with the cloud grid, and they don't want to be the voice of the cloud grid. So if they try to set that up, then either one of two things will happen. The other person will either accept sort of going back to the more stable phase of the borderline because it's it's packaged in a nicer way because it, it has a kind of because it, it has that same advertisement and promotion that they're going to be malleable and that they you know they're going to make the sort of the false advertising promise or whatever that um that they're just going to sort of scatter shot you with envelopes that have suggestive subtexts which they won't you know be responsible for 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 tabulating or keeping track of or being responsible for catering to themselves they want that function outsourced and if there's there's a sharp rejection because because the the reason why the house of mirrors was even imported in the first place was because the other person was not doing the codependent role that is uh, that is compatible with the borderline's demand of their host, of the host of their feeling body, uh, or the feeling body that they're using as a host. If there's a sharp rejection, then they will essentially just oscillate back into the house of mirrors, but then they will have a new they will have a renewed use of the House of Mirrors because, as I said before, it's hard to keep the House of Mirrors functioning if you don't have a participant that is forced into dealing with you and, and, and going through some kind of ongoing drama because then they can't... They can't project their unilateral environmental house of mirrors that they, they can't describe that into reality so if they can't if they don't have an access into knowing that it's being absorbed then it's very hard to keep the house of mirrors going because as i said before they're going to generate some kind of cognitive dissonance because they're going to within the consistency of their house of mirrors it's going to be harder and harder for them to say that everything going wrong is the fault of the is it's going to be harder and harder for them to continue to exteriorize accountability they're going to need to fragment the mirrors further and it's very hard to fragment the mirror further unilaterally without some participation without some level of participation that then they can project onto so if they are sharply rejected, then at least they can make themselves out to be a victim of a new narrative scenario. They can see them, they can recast themselves as a new passive 
victim. And that essentially is the trigger that allows them to re-scatter the mirrors, to redistribute the mirrors and, and, to, and, to, and consign it as being an exterior react, a, a reaction uh, to an exterior condition that's being imposed on them. Because the whole point of scattering the house of uh, the fragments of the mirrors in the environment is to diffuse and dilute and, and um, divert and redirect attention from their lack of accountability, from their inability to contend any form of integrity or responsibility uh, as being the cause of anything. So, you know, they, they want to exteriorize accountability and blame. They, they want to completely subvert their own notion of being the cause of, of, of things that they might otherwise want or expect or something like that. So that they can always have the claim for what they want leveraged against other people. So, you know, the house of mirrors grows stale if, if they don't have the person actually going into it. Because if the person isn't acting within the house of mirrors, there's nothing to see a reflection of in all the fragments that are dispersed in all the different, you know, if, if you can't keep the person moving in within the house of mirrors, the scattered mirrors have nothing to, 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 um, to capture, uh, and to essentially in a diffu in the, in the diffuse way in which they're scattered to to misportray and to and to be misled you know the point about the house of mirrors is that it's fundamentally a misleading way of confabulating reality the problem is is that if if your if your host isn't on the line isn't available to sort of squirm a bit then there's nothing to reframe and to i mean obviously you'd have to re Re, redeploy the house of mirrors and needs to be renewed every now and again but if you don't have an active participant um, to 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 toy with it's very hard to to keep the house of mirrors in the calibrated consistency and then you end up accumulating the the kind of the cognitive dissonance that you you actually find things that happen that you know because you see the house of mirrors is a tangible particularized treaties and constitution of exteriorized blame it is a damning um it it, it is a, a codified um bill as it were so you know it, it's like within certain ideological things it's like you know having a tangible demand for reparations for, for a particular historical evil or something like that. Well, once you've actually codified it in a, in, a, in a fixed quantifiable way, well, that actually conceptually puts a cap on the ideology itself. Because it says, well, if this actually just gets met, then actually now we have internal accountability. Now, we, now there's no excuse for us to not contend accountability. This is the problem with the House of Mirrors. The House of Mirrors gets into that self limiting quandary unless it has a wriggling participant to toy with and to reframe and to renew the house of mirrors uh, thing so it has to sort of come up with new re realizations and it's very hard to come up with new realizations completely by yourself without without you starting to realize that actually this is just a unilateral fabrication you know well they know that it's a unilateral fabrication on the inner child side but in terms of deploying this mechanism, because I do think it's a completely ostentatious behavior. It's an ostentate. I don't think they believe that even the House of Mirrors functionality has any real rigor or truth. It's 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 a it's part of the affectation of of a certain phase of the meat puppet that their feeling body is there to to sucker someone in into being a kind of codependent um amalgam i mean the house of mirrors itself is fundamentally fundamentally requires somebody else's integrity in order to confabulate and divert attention from the missing accountability in the narrative and so you know they will try to retreat from the house of mirrors by making a kind of an earlier, by, by trying to revive an earlier dynamic, an earlier compact, if, if any other iteration ever worked, to some degree, as a kind of, as a, 
as a kind of as a lesser of two evils of, of seeing if they can get the person if the, if their other person is is willing to be induced back into into a more stable and familiar kind of dynamic um, obviously this is premised on the host being able to essentially pick back up the cloud grid and to do that work of it of exterior administration and management and and also obviously accountability that is um, surreptitiously pawned off on, onto the host and as I say if if that offer is rejected then essentially they can just double down on the house of mirrors they can say oh uh, you know you, you have frustrated my emotional sanctity uh, you, you, you're hurtful um, you know basically just more on the theme of essentially avoiding consequences and responsibility avoiding you know it's just part it's just part and parcel of that procession and that theme but it has a kind of inbuilt it can win either way so either it gets what it it, it will always be able to profit from its own dishonesty in in that sense because it will essentially take itself hostage you can't stop it from taking itself hostage from the new narrative so it will be hostage to this new narrative, which it will describe as being caused by your external uh, style of participation, which was not commensurate and not deserved of the state that, that it professes to be. So it can just continue to self-report and therefore elect an exterior body as a cause of its new narrative that it takes its... Uh, that it allows itself to be taken hostage by. And so it can make you the cause of, of it being taken hostage of the new narrative. Is it either it gets codependency or it gets to take itself hostage and exteriorize the cause of that hostage taking. Um, and in some sense, this is the, the meta function of the House of Mirrors itself. It's just a waypoint. But it, it is a waypoint in such a way, and I believe in such a wise, as to be e emblematic of, it's actually trying to portray, tacitly, it is fully signaling to the host, this work has to be done by someone, and I'm either going to do it or you're going to do it. And wouldn't it be better now if you would do it? So let me do it for now and portray it to you and condition you and show it to you, exemplify it to you, demonstrate it. And then I will then proposition a retreat so that you can go back to doing it instead. This is why I keep on saying it's all a show. It's the whole thing is fucking intelligent. It's not... It's not just these random phases of random cycling. And in fact, even in part of the attempt to, to retreat back to the, the more familiar sort of parent role that they want the host to take. I mean, because this can be done in many ways. This is why I think that they just sometimes um, borderlines will go through phases of just utter chaos and just utter... Um, utter hysterical rampages because they want to induce some kind of environmental agent or figure to administer some form of control or imposition or rule because then they have a line of drama with which to weave and develop and to cocoon into either the leveraging of um, enforcing codependency or enforcing narrative hostage taking, both of which solidify their unaccountability. Um, anyway, th that's the individual borderline, but you can see the kind of the ideological parallels that this has with um, the kind of what I would call the tactical infiltration of. Um, hard and soft power within the cultural hegemony that even if we can say that okay well it's not obvious that feminism is the cultural hegemon but they have enough tactical bases covered 
They have certain academic voices le le lending them credence. They have certain very important material power structures uh, of how the legal system functions itself, and, and that is infiltrated into you know, work environments, uh, what do they call it, uh, human resources and, and, you know, best practices. And, you know, they, they've got their kangaroo court set up. They've got their, and, and they've got a whole narrative behind it that essentially facilitates the substitution of practical pragmatism and working out how to actually make the best of any situation and being realistic and that can all just be substituted with subjective feelings and impressions while women have no obligation uh, uh, to, 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 to manifest any kind of integrity or any kind of consistency or reasonableness. Um, and that, that power that, that they are given in a special sense then is leveraged against male integrity because men have to be have to have to offer integrity uh, relative to this narrative of of systemic oppression and they have to be responsible on behalf of this 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 general narrative um that essentially uh that we must all regard ourselves as being taken hostage uh uh by and, and that we all have to deal with in our in our separate roles according to um as i say again this way of being able to also interrupt trust, interrupt the notion of trust, is, is it becomes a, um, the, the interpersonal trust, which is generally the thing that keeps society sane, is being, having to reason things on an individual level, rather than on the level of macro systemic narratives and, and ideological themes and such, the trust itself is fundamentally uprooted and obviated by the ideological um, and tactical deployment um, in key places that has essentially made it impossible to have, uh, uh, as, as I've described before, the negotiating table, the honest negotiating table can be seen by men, but it cannot be seen by women, or, or it cannot be accessed by women without sacrificing too much of what women are used to dealing with and dealing through. Um, because they've got too much convenient societal, societally endorsed propaganda that, you know, to be a woman means to be means means uh, to be oppressed and to be a man means to be privileged and you know the, 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 they can't even see the um, the disparity between all the hard power that men wielded uh, was confronted by a woman's choice she at least had it at least once and even in re in, in, in a lot of history uh, they they had more choice than that. Um, they also uh, had other ways of um, expressing their displeasure and such. Um, And they had, they had safeguards and guarantees for things which men could never hope to secure within culture, that men could never hope to um, ensure for themselves, because that was the, the, um, the difference between the gender roles. And now we've had this... Um, instead of going down the route of, of the, the non-sexism of the 90s and trying to promulgate solutions to, to practical challenges, which I do think Sam Wagner does go through 
an array of, of real practical asymmetries which, which have to be taken into account. But I think the reason why we haven't gotten into a more reasonable development on these issues is because the, the almost the more lowest common do denominator factors that would generally tend towards um, facilitating culture into developing solutions of compromise and, and certain senses of, of realism and things like that have been fundamentally subverted. And I talk about the in inflation of standards and the inflation of um, strange expectations um, that are unsustainable uh, in a kind of hypothesized um, imagination sphere of feeling body which which is part of this um, collective insanity uh, uh, which takes up a large section of the zeitgeist which I mean I believe that is best described as something like a looming Führer principle and or a looming uh, I mean we I, I've described in politics how the Führer principle I think is already well on its way to being evolved and even intellectually within, within academia how um, it is it is already quested after as, as a holy grail. Uh, you know, you can see this in um, a, a, a epistemic uh, uh, justice, uh, in, in, you know, as, as a section of the philosophy department that I think is, um, is rife uh, with, with, with trying to um, slap a more substantial um, credence to this whole process of um, histrionic culture. Anyway, I, I'm talking about a lot of different things, but anyway, that's, um, I guess it's just more of the same.